Welcome to the fifth in a series we are calling L&D's Pivot to Performance, in which Guy Wallace and myself, David James, speak with esteemed guests about their own pivot from learning focused practice towards performance orientation that more predictably and reliably, let alone efficiently and successfully, achieves demonstrable results for both employees and organizations. Over a total of seven sessions, each two weeks apart, we've invited guests that we know have made the pivot and have achieved real results from doing so. We'll invite our guests to share their stories, we'll question them on their approaches and encourage them to share relatable experiences to inspire you to either initiate or enhance your own pivot. And we'll also seek opportunities for you to get involved as well. But perhaps we should start with our own introductions, including our own pivot from a learning focus to performance focus. Guy, would you like to kick us off? Thank you, David. Yes. So everyone, hello, my name is Guy Wallace. I've been in this business since August of 1979. I was one of the few that was very lucky in that from the very beginning, the people that I went to work with had a performance orientation and they taught me the methods and approaches of the late Gary Rumler, Tom Gilbert, Bob Mager, and Joe Harless, some of the gurus from the bat past uh, 60s and 70s and 80s, et cetera. Um, so I was very lucky in that, that I didn't really have to make a pivot. I was kind of dropped into this performance orientation and served me well. I worked at two different companies back in the 79 through 82. And I left Motorola in 82 and joined a small consulting firm. And my focus was to build an ISD, instructional systems design practice uh, within the consulting firm. And I helped grow that. But the secret sauce to everything, in, in my opinion, is having this performance orientation. Um, whether you call it learning or instruction or training or now learning experience design, I think it's necessary for you, for all of us, to have that performance orientation to focus on what people have to do back on the job. Um, and so I partnered with David in this series so that we could help uh, sh share other people's stories and their journey in making the pivot to performance and, and how they're actually doing this. Um, so I'm, I'm very grateful to our guest today and uh, to David for, for co-sponsoring uh, this with us. Wonderful. Thanks, Guy. Um, and uh, just to add my, my own introduction and, uh, and pivot, so I, I spent uh, 15 years uh, in-house in learning and development. Uh, with eight years of those uh, running learning and development for Disney at different levels in the UK and then Europe, Middle East and Africa. And um, perhaps counter to, to Guy's experience, I, I became what I thought was a, was a, a, a very talented uh, and experienced trainer uh, and, uh, and training, design, uh, training designer. Uh, but it wasn't until I, I reached my roles in Disney when no one was talking about learning and training and they were talking about actual transformation and not the pithy version of such, but during such a disruptive period of between 2006 and 2014, I really was brought in to, to help uh, entire organizations to either to pivot themselves uh, or to, uh, to merge. Uh, and we didn't rely on training courses and we certainly didn't uh, use e-learning for that. When it actually really mattered, we had to roll our sleeves up and run mini accelerated apprenticeships, but it required analysis up front. And it required us to, uh, to finish uh, our efforts with people being able to fundamentally do something different and often for different results. So that's why I think that it's uh, absolutely critical that many people will join this profession and think it's one thing, then they'll get to another level and then they'll realize it's another. And I think that, uh, that the stories that we'll be sharing with our guests throughout this um, uh, will help to, to make this point. But, but that's enough about us. And it's time for this week's guest, Philip Lamb. Philip, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So nice uh, to be here. Thanks, Philip. Um, perhaps uh, you could start off by giving us a short introduction to you and your background in L&D. Yeah, sure. Um, so I uh, work at a, a Swedish bank called uh, a fintech, a company called Klarna. Um, and uh, I've been here for um, uh, a little over six, uh, six years now. Mm -hmm. um, previous to that, I uh, worked as a management consultant for, for a couple of years. So um, and while doing that, it was mostly focusing on uh, developing leaders and, and uh, developing salespeople. Those were the two areas where companies was willing to invest um, the most in the two cohorts. Um, so for the, I think for the last um, 10 years, I've been working at either uh, equipping or developing people 
um, for um, uh, international organizations, uh, first externally and then internally uh, for Klarna. I actually made the switch uh, from being a consultant to doing it in-house because I wanted to see, um, you know, to learn how hard it is to actually move the needle when you work for a company instead of drawing uh, fancy PowerPoints and talking about strategy, but actually getting your hands dirty and, and actually make people better and, and talk to people and, and create stuff that actually changes stuff in an organization. And that requires um, so much more than, than just having this strategic approach. It actually requires you to do the work as well. So that's why I made the switch. Yeah, wonderful, Philip. I think it can't be underestimated the difference between in-house and and perhaps the provider of services. Um, in line with uh, with the, the the title here of you know L and D's pivot to performance, could you explain to us what your personal pivot to performance was? Uh, what was normal uh, for you before, uh, and what was your aha moment if there was one, and uh, what did that lead you towards? Yeah, I don't think this was uh, one aha moment. I think it's actually something that has been building inside of me um, throughout, you know, um, throughout my time uh, doing everything. I think I started working when I was 16, mm. but for many years I actually did. Um, so I did martial arts and I competed in Taekwondo. I, I trained with uh, world champions, uh, Olympic athletes. And, and when you train with people on that level, uh, what I realized was that um, every single minute that we spent on training we we removed everything that had to do with self-defense or anything that didn't make you better at what you were supposed to do. Uh, we, st- we stripped that. And um, you could never slack uh, when, you, when you train on that level. So I remember one moment where we were doing a combination and the last combination, in the last combination, um, we were supposed to um, kick the other person in the head and we have helmets to protect the head when we do that of course uh, but this person my sparring partner he he didn't have a helmet so what i did was that i i stopped my foot just before i hit his head um and when i did that he looked at me he moved this close and started screaming and shouting in my face and imagine that you're a 15 year old training with adults and he's screaming in my head he says the next time you don't kick me in the head i'll kick you in the head um and and <laughs> Obviously, this is not the environment that we want to create uh, at work, but he was teaching me a lesson that you train the way that you want to perform, Mm -hmm. right? And so um, having a performance-oriented training is important everywhere. And then after that, I I did um, two different degrees in university. So I did one in sports science and I did one in psychology. Um, I worked as a designer for a while. I worked as a health consultant. I worked as an entrepreneur. I did everything. And um, from all of this, you sort of stitch together, like how, how do you really learn when you do all of these things? How do you learn to do so many different things? And how do you get good at things? Um, and, you know, the one thing that I saw that was clear was that one, it, w- it was possible to teach yourself these things through either mentoring or reading or and using uh, books and online resources. So it's possible to learn. That's one thing that you can believe that you can change the outcome for people. And then the other thing is that um, um, you need to be um, laser focused on what makes a difference. So when I worked as a consultant, that was the main, that was the main job always. Uh, go in there, find out what does the um, what does the below average people, what, what do they do? What sort of behaviors, what sort of skills, what sort of mindsets do they have? And then the average people, what do they do? And then the top performance, what do they do? Do you know the difference between that? Um, and unless you know those things, unless you ask for those things, you can never really build programs that is highly, highly targeted. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, which means that you're creating something that you believe will have effect, but from an accountable side. So if you're a business leader, if you're someone who's trying to um, sell more or transform the business or doing anything, um, your, your first um, instinct isn't to improve somebody's um, resilience towards stress. It's, it's actually the performance. And through understanding that, you are willing to invest in however much training it's needed just like an athlete is willing to go to the workout session on a Monday because they know that this will lead to better performance. Mm. But if I told the athlete, 
okay, so you have an Olympic tournament in six months. Um, let's watch some fun videos. Like that's not going to work. Like they know already six months ahead that every single minute is, has to be planned. Um, some of it has to be training. Some of it has to be performance. Some of it has to be like, they know all of that. Mm. But I think in, in L and D it's seldom that we, like I talk about, sometimes I talk about um, um, growing tomatoes. Like if you're a farmer and you're growing tomatoes, um, and you're trying to, and, and you're, you're trying to buy tomatoes, um, then you can decide, do I go to a farmer locally and, and ask them, um, can you grow the tomatoes? How long will it take? Um, how much will it cost? And so on. Or do you just buy it from another country? And the farmer will be able to tell you. But in l and um, often we cannot um, express um, what are we training for? Um, who are we training for? What will they be when we're done? If we train them, what are they? <laughs> Um, can they actually do the job? And if we don't know those things, then who's willing to invest in it? I think so. So all of these things have taught me that, you know, you know, if you, for example, work with salespeople and what you are providing salespeople isn't actually helping them closing sales, no one's going to want to take your training. Yeah. Nobody is going to think that it's important. But if you can show them and convince them that what they will do will improve their sales, they will fight for a spot in your training program. You don't need to convince anyone because <laughs> they're going to they're gonna think it's unfair that you don't give them time now. Yeah. Um, so I think if you have, that's because I've worked with salespeople for a long time. It taught me that once you move to a central L&D position, that's, that's sort of what you need to keep. You need to keep that laser focus on taking, taking the strategy from, for the organization and then looking at translating that into human behavior. So what is it that we're asking people to do in order to move the entire organization towards the same way? Mm -hmm. And then looking at the delta. So the delta is what is it that people are asked to do and what is it that they can do today? And then you train the delta. Mm -hmm. um, but if you don't know what the delta is, um, then obviously it's gonna be very hard to decide to, how to prioritize, what to work on and what to create, um, what should training be about. So I think all of these things have taught me um, uh, to pivot to performance. Yeah, brilliant. I think that uh, there's, there's so much great stuff in there. Um, you know, that that part about engagement uh, that you're saying about people wanting to be involved in L&D, uh, the way that I look at it is, it's not hard to convince 12 people every few weeks to attend a class. It's really not that hard. But so much digital is not involved with, with you know, it's not engaged with to any meaningful amount because you can't convince a great deal of people to get involved in something if it isn't deemed valuable to them in the context of what it is that they're trying to do. And I think that there's a there's a real mismatch there. I like the way that you've just described Delta. You know, there's so much of, of, of what Guy and I have, have talked about in this series and, uh, and, uh, and well before that is that if you don't understand the performance problem uh, or what it is that people are trying to do, then you have next to no chance of actually affecting that. And then what we do as n and is that we seek unintended consequences to validate our intervention. Like, oh, it's just good to bring people together. You know, a minute spent training is better than no minute spent training. You know, it's, you know, it's, it's absolute rubbish. Um, but, but, um, when it comes to analysis and discovery, I'm sure that you've refined your approach um, uh, over uh, over your career. But could you share with us um, some highlights of what works for you, and then we can dive deeper into it into a mo in a moment? Yeah, I think the um, the diagnostic phase is um, quite similar to what it's like being a management consultant. Mm -hmm. So you can almost take the mindset of uh, if you're an L and D person you can run the L&D organization as, as its own company inside a company. And if you cannot sell your services and convince someone to buy your services, um, then there's something wrong with how you provide your services. So, mm -hmm. so the approach that we are taking is that we, we have built sort of the same approach as a consultant would do. You come in, you, um, you listen, you ask questions, you do diagnostics. So I, I tell people that... Um, you are sort of more as a, uh, imagine uh, a personal trainer versus a bartender. So if you go to a bartender and says, hey, can you make me um, whatever drink? And they'll say, just say, yes, I'll, I'll do it. 
but if you go to a personal trainer and say, I'd like to lose some weight, uh, but I only, have, um, um, I only have time for training two times a week, then that trainer won't tell you, yes, I'll do it. That trainer will tell you, no, you're out of your mind. Actually, you're going to need to listen to me. Um, so they will challenge you. And, and it's, it's the same way for l and uh, where you bring some sort of expertise um, and you need to challenge the organization on what they think um, um, should be done. Um, and you, you do it as a partnership. So, so, you know, what we're trying to find out is, you know, first of all, should there be a training? Um, are they actually looking to improve some sort of behaviors? Do they know what great looks like? Um, what happens if we don't do a training at all? Um, I think there's so many uh, already established approaches that you can just copy uh, from different books. Um, and um, I think there's one episode with uh, Sebastian Tindall uh, in the first of the series where he also gives uh, examples of some of the questions that he asked. Um, and we, we use a similar approach. So we, we just written down valuable questions that we would like to ask. Um, and then, uh, but that's, I think that's not the hard part, but if you ask those questions uh, and they are valuable towards the customer, then they will want to engage with you because they, they are trying to improve their performance. They know they are competing. They know they need to be better. They want to be better. Um, it's not always that they think that the training is the solution. So if the training is the solution, that's what you need to convince them of. Um, and sometimes um, what you need to challenge them on is, is, the, you know, is the approach as well. Mm -hmm. Like in most of my meetings, I actually tell people that um, it's not training that you're after. You, um, maybe they're trying to, um, um, most approaches are that they have some sort of faulty process and they think training will solve their faulty process. Mm -hmm. um, so they say nobody does, does anything that with the way that we intended people to do. And so we would, there's something people are being irresponsible. So we would like to train people to do the right thing. And being, you know, if you, if you come from a background of psychology, you never think like that. You know that humans are irrational. Um, so you design things around the irrationality. You don't, you don't, don't train people the other way around. Mm -hmm. You know, I learned this from... Um, the reason I actually went into psychology was that Google said that they hired the most psychologists in the world. And the reason for that is that because they wanted to make their products human centric and not the other way around. And so if you know that humans are going to act a certain way, then you actually need to change your process or your approach to fit humans, not the other way around. Mm. Um, it's like, have you ever seen if somebody had have created a road like this and then everybody just walks like this instead, because that's the closest distance and nobody uses the grass, so there's the grass here in the middle, it just ruins the grass because everybody prefers this way. And there's someone who hasn't understood how humans work that have designed that road. And um, so they end up just, you know, ruining the grass instead. Mm. And um, so for us, it's going into those discussions, trying to uncover what is the actual, um, what are the symptoms that they are seeing? What is the root cause to those symptoms? And how do you solve it? Is it by training people? And if you are training people, then we train people. We just, we don't um, just think about information sharing. Mm. Um, and you, you just go through that process of thinking about how do I take someone that doesn't know anything um, from A uh, to B and think about that entire psychological process it takes for a human um, that um, are naturally resistant towards new information. Like we would, mm. Like if I told you, you can never shop in your favorite store again, you have to find a, you know, a different store and go somewhere else that only that is difficult. Like, and then if you're trying to teach people new skills, of course, it's going to be hard. So you need to think very carefully about what is it that they need to learn first, second, third, and fourth, and, and, and so on. So, so all of that is, is sort of, we standardize. And the reason for standardizing is that of course, that if you hire more people, um, change people, you need to be able to replicate your success. Mm. So uh, for us, it's, it's, it's been very important to, to define what is the approach, what are the questions that we're asking, and what is the outcome that we're looking for. And then when once we go into training mode and then start discussing how to design the training, every single person in the team also needs to understand what is the bar, like how are trainings done here so that we don't end up in 
completely different um, experiences depending on who's doing it. Mm. What what you just described there, uh, as you said, you, you listened back to Sebastian's um, uh, conversation, and your approach is uh, is similar in uh, in under fi- in in the analysis and uh, and recognizing the uh, the performance gaps. I wonder whether then uh, there'll be value in us talking about how you do this at scale, because one of the challenges we get from this is when you move from a topic centric approach to a performance or a human centered approach, people look at that that think if you go in, if you're going um, bottom up then you're taking individual learning needs because they're coming from it from a learning and development, a traditional learning and development perspective. Top down means we need you to know this and we don't really need to know your job. But bottom up, does it look like, I know that it's not, but, you know, does it look like individual learning needs? It's it's not. But how how do you scale uh, your your performance um, uh, orientation? Yeah, I think that's a very good question. So um, that is a um, constant challenge uh, when you're in an organization like ours that is in um, hyper growth. Because mm. when you're in hyper growth um, and we are growing headcounts 50% annually, and then you add on a natural attrition rate, then you can imagine how many people you need to hire um, every single year and how many new people are in the organization at any given point. Um, and also, if you're in hyper growth, then, then there's going to be new teams formed, um, um, new departments, and so on. And everybody's going to constantly wanting more support. So I think what most LMD teams can re- resonate with here is that you're going to feel, unless you change your approach, you're always going to feel that you're understaffed, under resourced. Um, you're always five steps behind everything, mm-hmm. and so um, I think a lot of people will then debate, well, we need, to, we, we need to prioritize. Do we optimize for quality? So we go in and do an intervention and we say no to things to keep focus or do we do things at scale and we reduce the quality and we just think that, okay, everybody has to have do-it-yourself solutions instead. And there's, a, I think there's a, there's a funny uh, meme on the internet where, you know, people are, they ask, should I buy an Xbox or a PlayStation? And the answer is yes. Like you don't choose. <laughs> yes is the answer. So do we scale? Yes. Do we optimize for quality? Yes. There's, there's, no, there's no other choice. Mm-hmm. But if you do that, you sort of need to rethink how everything is done. And we, we take some... Um, inspiration here from um, from uh, companies like um, Tesla, because um, Tesla does a lot of things very different from uh, from the industry. Um, uh, it's first of all, it's it's the first car manufacturer that over a hundred years has been able to mass produce cars. So in order to do that without going bankrupt, you actually need to rethink how you do everything and how you train people and how what sort of culture you create. So if I take the, um, Tesla has a car called the Model 3, um, which is their most popular car. It takes them 10 hours to produce one of these. And, and then you have Volkswagen, who, who is the world's largest car manufacturer and has loads of experience and resources uh, in how to do this. It takes them 30 hours to make their smallest electric vehicle. Imagine being 20 hours faster than your most skilled competitor. Hmm. Um, I, I don't know how scared people at Volkswagen are, but they should be very, very, very scared when they see these numbers. And you know, when I thought about like, okay, so if we are under-resourced, if we are, uh, how are we going to scale? And, and not only scale, but how are we going to compete then with companies um, like Apple, Facebook, Amazon, and so on? Um, you know, for example, in, in 2018, these big tech companies, they spent um, 75 billion US dollars on R&D. And um, the US government spent $25 billion on going to the moon. So the entire Apollo program uh, on converted into today's uh, money, that's $150. So in just one year, big tech spent half of the money that it takes for the US government to go to the moon. And then you think of like a small company like Klarna with uh, 6,000 employees, how am I going to compete with organizations like that if we are competing against the biggest tech companies? 
So the, when you ask me, how, how do we scale? We have to, of course, um, rethink every single uh, step in how we do our trainings. First of all, um, the standardization was highly important in order to uh, build the blueprint and the DNA in what makes a good training. So we do that and then we, we test and we iterate that approach knowing that, okay, so if we follow this every single time uh, with the same recipe, will it create a good training? And then we measure the actual outcome. So whatever the training is supposed to do, does that really happen? Mm. And, and the answer was a resounding yes. So we know that we can now we can replicate it. And then the other thing is that how do we do things at scale? And we thought about, um, obviously, we knew that we had to use technology um, somehow because we cannot, unless we um, have superhumans, there's no way that I can use humans to compete with the big resources. So I need to use technology and in a smart way somehow. So what we looked at is that we look at what is the natural behavior in your organization? And if you're in a hypergraph organization, you're going to hire a lot of smart people and ambitious people. And what's, what's the default behavior for them is to create a lot of uh, documents. So whenever they need to share something, convince someone, um, jot something down, they'll document it. They'll, have, they'll do PowerPoints, they'll do documents. So we know that there is a natural behavior already existing in the organization to target performance somehow that is not being leveraged by L&D. So the first, um, first solution we must do is to tap into that, those resources, which is exactly what we did. So we bought a, uh, we acquired an LMS that focused on simplicity and where the solution itself um, was so intuitive and, um, and, and worked just like a, a document editor. So if you know how to use Google Docs, you know how to use this tool so that we knew that if, if, that, if we made that happen, then people were also able to create the trainings together with us easily without us having a huge content creation team. So the only way for us to do that is to have people in the organization support us in this journey to create performance-related training. We would consult them and advise them, and they would do the actual creation. We would focus on creating the best ones. And, and when, when we went in, we wanted to make sure that these are going to be the, the, our flagship model uh, version of trainings, which will inspire everyone of what can this actually do. Uh, but the simplicity of the tool um, and, and the platform, meaning that everybody else could do it, uh, was one um, key in the step. The second one was that we had to retrain people in the team to think of the platform uh, almost like account managers. So um, not uh, thinking about them as L&D people only, but you are now responsible to grow the platform. So now we bring in product management and growth hacking into the place. So the more time um, in, the, in the early stages, we can make sure that this implementation grows and every single conversation we have with the suppliers, and, um, uh, and, and with our internal teams is how to get people onto the platform so that the platform um, becomes the default behavior to use when they need something. Um, and, and, and this worked um, really well. And also because we, um, we thought about the next step after this. So you, you have a natural behavior to create content already. Um, we tapped into that by, by buying a platform which enabled this. And then we thought about the next step is the hardest part for most people, which is distribution. Mm. Um, and distribution takes a lot of time because when you have attrition and a lot of people joining, it means that you need to keep track of who has the document, who has access, who's doing what, are you following up with people, um, are you collecting feedback from everyone? This takes a lot of time from l &D. So all of these things, if you think about from start to finish, um, if we only have very little resources, we need to think about how do we alternate as much as possible. Um, so I think the platform that we acquired, which is Loop, um, helped us. We saw that we could get all of these features in place so that we could focus on constantly innovating uh, our approach, innovating the, the way that we deliver content, and spend more time uh, with our stakeholders and with people in the organization to scale this 
instead of being stuck in content production and collecting feedback, doing admin, mm. um, all of those things completely um, automated. And um, so, you know, when I look at, when we do a new training now, and we, we did a training recently where um, uh, the content creators they took some bold um, chances and created some stories that we knew this might not work. And, um, uh, and some people loved it. A lot of people hated it. But um, the sp- speed in, in order in which we were able to launch the training, um, automate the feedback so that the first people that completes the training already gives us feedback on what works and what doesn't work. And then us being able to um, uh, rework the entire training um, and then launch a new version and collect new feedback and knowing that the new version works, um, that can be done within two weeks. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you have, so you know that every single time you launch something, uh, what, however it's going to go, it's going to work because of this, these mechanisms. Um, and that's only, I think that's an example of how we use technology to its, its, its maximum. Mm-hmm. Another, you know, another thing that we had to do, of course, is that even doing all of this, it's never enough. And, and we've since been able to hire much more people to the team. Uh, and still it's not enough because now the organization um, sees the success of the platform. So, and, and that spreads. So, so now more people want to work with us. Um, so from, I think in 13 months, we went from having 50 trainings in our platform to 1,950. Mm. And that's with two people in the team. Um, and that's a staggering amount of, of content production focusing on trying to uh, target what makes the difference in performance in, for, for each individual. So it's not general training. It's like for salespeople, it's sales related. For engineers, it's engineering related. Like it's training that is targeting what you do at work. And if you're doing that, um, you need to do it for everyone. You can't just be saying, well, for the next eight months, I'm going to work with the sales team and no one else is going to get support. So you need to find, that's why it was so important to do all of this so that we could support everyone at the same time. Mm. But even doing all of this, you still, like there's so much demand now that there's no stopping in, first of all, how many people I need to hire, but also how many people are trying to work with us. So we thought, you know, what makes the difference? Um, and it's the conversations that we have with our clients that makes a difference, that makes them think. So, okay, so we cannot remove that. We have to be in that room to discuss those things. Um, but how many other things that are related to the LMS or anything else that can be more scalable? So we created something that we call a masterclass. And instead of meeting with um, a stakeholder one-on-one, um, we just thought, let's bring them all into the room at the same time and work with all of them at the same time and see how that goes. Mm. So now we had 17 um, people in the same room at the same time. And we create a little scalable content that's being automated uh, into a program in loop. Um, and then we spend time on the steps that makes a difference for the training. And now you know it's gone 10 weeks and we can launch 17 training programs instead of one at a time. Yeah. Um, and then that this then becomes a community of people that has been trained that can now spread that knowledge and spread you know, the idea of creating performance-related content. And this just, um, it's just another example of how we constantly try to think about how, how can we do more uh, with the same amounts or uh, with just slightly more uh, resources. Yeah, wonderful, Philip. Would, um, at, at this point, um, before before I, I, I move forward, I would like to uh, invite any questions that, uh, just in case, uh, those joining us uh, do have. But but just to, before before we we do, Philip, just and just to clarify, uh, you're bringing seventeen business people in stakeholders, and they're you know, they're they're coming in to talk about what's really important to them. They're not yeah. coming in to talk about learning. But what you've been able to do is grow your team whilst you're automating again let's let's address one of the fears here that when when work is automated then there's less work for the humans what you're saying is the more you've automated and the more time you've saved that has elevated the status of the human beings and you've been able to grow the team have i, have I got that right you're absolutely on point um 
I think it's also um, more fun for the people that work in your team. So if you're an L&D professional uh, and you are doing admin today and you're imagine, mm-hmm. imagining a world where you're doing um, much less admin and spending more time doing mm-hmm. difficult stuff, it makes you more valuable. It makes you more valuable towards the team, towards the organization, and you can focus on complex things that cannot be replaced by a robot. Mm. And everything else um, is automated. I, I can't, there's, I don't think there's, um, there's not many downsides to automate. I don't, I haven't heard from anyone. I wish we didn't have automation so that I could do it instead. I've never heard that from anyone. And I, you know, since we didn't have any, any sort of automation 13 months ago, now there are over 140 automations running in the background every single day. So every single thing that a human would, would need to do, 140 of them a robot is doing every single day. And it's also increasing. <laughs> Yeah, brilliant. So, Philip, yeah, yeah, it goes here. Don't be frightened of automation. It's eliminating your admin and and elevating what what your humans are there to uh, to how they add the uh, the most value. I think that's fascinating. Uh, Guy, do we have any questions? Yes, we yes we do. Uh, some of those you've already answered, Philip. Uh, uh, somebody was asking what LMS you're using, and Loop was your answer, I believe. Um, Another person asked about, uh, have you considered uh, user-generated content? And I think you answered that as well in that the answer is yes. Um, Somebody, a new question just popped up here. Have you uh, managed to redefine learning with your clients and learners? Many uh, still both assume it's a need and, uh, and, and define the solution in advance. They come to you and ask for training or learning. Um, uh, and I think you talked a little bit about that, but uh, so how do you, you, you standardize your approach, which was the question I was asking, because a lot of people are afraid of standardized approaches. So, but, so you're, you're working with your stakeholders, you're working with content, uh, uh, people to help you, de- you develop content. Can you talk a little bit more about, about that? Yeah, I think, uh, um, in terms of, uh, Sorry, could you could you repeat the the last part so that I'm just clear about what I should answer first? Yeah, that's uh, uh, this is a question from uh, uh, is asking when you're we- working with your stakeholders and they come to you and they've asked for training, you know, or learning, you know, how do you work with them in that? Because the the, the answer may not be training or learning; it may be the process okay. is bad and they need to fix that. So, so yeah. can you talk a little bit about the working with? stakeholders uh, when they presume uh, the, the solution? Yes, um, it's, it's the same. Um, so it's just asking uh, those questions. Um, so if I, if I take the, the, the latest one um, where somebody uh, said that um, a lot of people don't know how to use the travel management uh, system. And so they are sending a lot of questions uh, to the team to ask if you know, they can approve a lot of travels, um, while in reality, it's just that the, the closest manager approves the travel and then they, they can just book it. Um, and they wanted to create a training and send everybody to that training so that people felt comfortable booking. And um, I said that um, this isn't, your, your problem isn't really training related. And uh, we just went into depth of talking about, you know, um, the reason why people are asking the questions isn't because they are, it isn't because they're stupid. Um, it isn't because they are lazy. Uh, it's because uh, of just human convenience. When you're in that situation, when you want to do something, you just, you just want to be able to do it and, and get the confirmation that you want. Is this okay to book this? Um, and what's the fastest way of doing it? And the fastest way of doing it is to email the people that you can see on the screen that are responsible for whatever you're working with. And so, and, and what they can relate to is that the company Klarna is built on convenience. Like our entire product exists because it's more convenient than other alternatives. And so they can relate to that. And so they understood that, okay, so if I do a training, which means that if when somebody gets to that stage, they have to jump out, do the training, then come back and then book the travel, it's not going to happen. So if you can paint that picture, nobody's going to think, 
uh, okay, let's let's invest time. Let's all get together, invest a lot of time, and create a training um, that doesn't solve the actual problem. Um, so what's going to happen instead is that you need to provide the the learner with that um, information in the right time when they need it, and that's going to remove all the questions. So if they can get that when they need it, they're not going to ask you the questions. There's another question here about uh, how did you get your colleagues who are super busy with their operational work uh, in a hyper growth company to contribute their time to generate learning content? Oh, that's an excellent question. Um, we had no idea that it was going to be, um, I have to say it exploded. Um, we obviously, we had very big ambitions, uh, but the way that it's being received has, is beyond our, you know, our wildest ambitions even. Um, and I think it comes back to what I talked about before, which is people, you know, people join a company like Klarna from all over the world. So there are people from over 80 different um, nationalities that work in this company. Some of them move, you know, when I started, somebody had moved from Silicon Valley um, to Stockholm. Um, so he worked in Silicon Valley on a Friday and on Monday he was sitting next to me in Stockholm. And you don't do those things just to, like you do that because you care about your career and you want to be able to perform. So when you tell people that, hey, um, we are not going to create anything that feels like a burden for anyone. Like all we are trying to do is that whatever you as a business leader is trying to communicate to your organization, the things that you want your people to do, we will help you translate that into words and into a training. That's it. Um, and who, like, who wouldn't want to do that? So if you're running a team, if you're running an organization and you want everyone to be better, if you could find a way to document what you want to convey, what you want people to do, wouldn't you do that? Wouldn't you want to be able to do that? I think one example of something that can be super powerful is there's a training call. It's just a document, but somebody in an organization 15 years ago got tired of all the bad product managers that existed in, in his company. So he created a document that he called good product manager versus bad product manager. And he said, this is what a good product manager does. And this is what a bad product manager does. And that was so good that it, that document has lived on for 15 years and it has no pictures. There, there are no things where you need to move one thing from one side to the other <laughs> side and match them. And there are no videos to watch. It's just a simple, concise document on what someone does to do a good job and a bad job. And that's all you need. That's, it's hyper-focused on performance, which is why everybody loves it, which is why it's lived on for 15 years, even though the world has changed in these 15 years. So if you understand how to um, get the DNA of actual performance, you don't even need a picture. <laughs> Yeah. You just need the actual content. And that is the same as what your super busy operational leaders are doing as well. They are trying to think about how do I elevate the business? How do I leverage everyone's performance? How do I get everyone involved? It's through communication. And your training can be that strategic communication that they need if it focuses on closing that delta, that you know, accelerate that gap that exists with addressing the skills and behaviors that somebody needs to focus on. Great. One, one last question, if we might, uh, this might be a short one. What are the cons of the convenience you have created? Is there any downside? <laughs> well, it depends on if you like to work a lot or not. Um, <laughs> the, um, the one downside is, um, so last year I had, um, um, I mean, I had two people in my, in my team. And um, when I was catching up with, with David before we did this session, you know, I had four teams and 30 people. And um, the amount, you know, when we're thinking and planning about the amount of people I was going to hire for the coming four years, the the organization the the feedback that i got that i think you should double that number the number that i put in that what i thought this is ambitious they doubled that number so i think when you do something that is 
well received um, and you can show I think it's not just well received because everyone can pick up any book about performance consulting and run with it but can you execute on a very high level um, just like my, my example with Tesla like can you organize the team can you can you standardize can you can you showcase a high executional capability then why wouldn't you invest in that and I think that's you know, the downside is just like everything is so much bigger now and so much more uh, complicated. So, so it's fun. It's super fun, but it's obviously it's, it's more work for sure. Mm. Great. Um, Philip, um, people are going to be at different stages uh, uh, of this. And, you know, this is the fifth in our, our series here. Uh, and uh, it's always important about how people um, will apply a performance orientation within their context. And as we've heard from Sebastian and Anne-Marie and from, uh, from uh, Dawn and from Ken before, um, it, does, you know, it, it requires a different approach and it, it, it requires an understanding of the context. Um, what suggestions do you have for others who will be live with us today or, or watching the recording? Um, what, what suggestions will you have for them in adopting or adapting their current approach? Yeah. Um, I think um, one is to decide um, that you want to try it out. Um, because once you uh, decide, you, you will need to focus. And if you have never done it before, if you don't have any experience of doing it, you will actually need to upskill yourself, of course. So just, um, just the fact that, um, I mean, I guess that if you're listening to this, you're actually interested um, in, in doing it, in doing a pivot to performance. Um, so... Um, I think that decide that you want to do it. Um, it doesn't take much. You can basically do this uh, tomorrow. Um, mm. Sign your first and or just download the first um, questionnaire for diagnosing and doing a needs analysis and try it out and, and see what sort of feedback you get and adapt your approach um, to fit your style. Um, and as you get better, you'll see that um, the response is going to be as good as well so i mean we have this uh, yeah i'm gonna go with the nike slogan just do it brilliant and that's what we've heard pretty much from everybody you don't have to wait for the culture to change you don't need ceo yeah. buy-in you don't need line managers to support it all you need to do is have a different conversation at the outset about the work itself about performance and results rather than learning and then it becomes uh, much more apparent what, uh, what what needs to happen because you're speaking with the stakeholders about what's important to them. Uh, Guy, do we have any more questions coming through? Oh, we do have one, uh, a couple actually. So does Klarna provide recognition and rewards for people contributing to the learning content development efforts? It's people not inside your department, but the other people that are contributing? You do? Um, yeah, that? I think... Um... It, uh, it, it not on a uh, perhaps not on a global level, um, but it I mean it, it is something that we expect from um, from everyone. Uh, it's it's part of especially if you're quite senior, um, then it's you know we design it in every competency framework. It's you know coaching and sharing and and uh, making other people better is part of the job. And if we actually help them scale that, it makes their job easier. Mm. Very good. So uh, somebody said that based on your answer to the cons for convenience, long hours and working above and beyond, how are you incorporating wellness and balance within your workforce? Yeah, I think um, it really it really depends. And I think the, the culture as such isn't that you are supposed to um, uh, do long hours and weekends and, and so on. I think it's more about the the intensity of the work, not that you're working weekends and, and uh, long hours. Um, but um, I think what's good is that there's, um, and obviously if you're the type of person that has, um, has a hard time restricting your working hours, there's, there's support in place um, for that as well. But I think it's more in the culture that is be, it's okay it's okay to go home after a certain time. And, and it being a Swedish company, work-life balance is super, uh, super important. Um, but then it's also, um, it's also hard because uh, the people that we employ uh, come from all over the world. 
and uh, sometimes they are so hardworking that they it's it's just it, it's hard. Um, I get for, I, I'll give you one example where I I gave em, my employees a day off for free, and they still worked. Um, and uh, and then you tell them to stop working, and they don't do it. So they, sometimes they don't even um, don't even listen uh, to you. But uh, it's it's just because they, I think when the work is super fun, super engaging, and you can see a lot of impact of what you're doing. People get excited. It's it's you know this is this means something to them. It's something that they will you cherish and, and carry with them in the career. Are there uh, other systems that you're using besides Loop? Um, we use Loop as our main um, LMS, um, and then we we can add on other systems which we do as well. So we add on other system to, uh, for example, uh, provide certifications or something like that. Uh, but we use uh, we use Loop as the main system, uh, main access points uh, for everyone. Somebody has uh, recognized a book in the background behind you, but uh, so but the but the question generally is, uh, what performance related books would you recommend? And I'll extend that to what people or other resources might you identify for people that that have had an impact uh, with you and uh, in your efforts? What would you recommend to other people as yeah. a scientist? Well, um, well, Guy, I know you have published a lot of books, um, so maybe we can, <laughs> just, uh, now you can plug that in uh, as well. Uh, and then, David, you have a lot of things published as well. So obviously, um, I think the, the latest book that I, uh, that I read that I thought was really, really good, um, it's called, um, and perhaps it's, this is the one that people um, saw in the background, driving performance uh, through learning. And actually, you can see there's a commentary from David. <laughs> <laughs> Get everywhere. Yeah. Um, that one's really good. Um, it's a good starter. Um, you don't, I mean, I'm, a, I'm an avid reader, so I read tons and tons of books um, and articles. But, you know, just start with one. That's it. If you, mm. if you don't know one, just start with one or just Google performance consulting best books and pick the first one on Amazon, and that's how you get started. Uh, any more, Guy, to finish off, or uh, is it uh, time to wrap up? Uh, I, I think that there's just some nice comments in the uh, the chat area that, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's scrolled by me right now. But basically, if you're doing good work, you're going to get recognition. You're going to get the support of your organization, which I think is the key theme. Don't ask for permission. Just go ahead and start doing this. Start somewhere and get some results, and those results will help uh, build your reputation uh, of your capability to do this kind of work, and the demand will grow. Mm. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, I completely agree. There's no downsides um, uh, to, uh, to to starting off having a, a very different conversation. Uh, but Philip, this has been fascinating. We can tell by the, uh, the amount of questions and comments that we've had so far that it's been hugely appreciated. Uh, and thank you, everybody, for uh, for your input and for uh, for joining us today. Uh, the uh, we'll make the the recording available uh, on YouTube and uh, on guys' channels as well. And so we'll uh, be sending out an email with uh, with a link to that. Uh, if not tomorrow, then certainly later uh, on this week. Uh, we have one more session with a guest uh, with one guest uh, in two weeks' time. With um, tell me if I've got the name wrong, uh, guy uh, Steve Villachica. That's it. Yep. Okay, great. Uh, two weeks today. Uh, and we've got a one final session uh, in which we're inviting a panel back. We had some, uh, some feedback and somebody asked us, could we have a conversation rather than uh, simply asking some questions? So we're going to be doing that on the 15th of December. So uh, we'll let you know again uh, via email and you'll be able to, to sign up for that. Uh, thank you very much again for joining us. Uh, and we'll hope that you'll be joining us uh, in two weeks time for the, for the last two sessions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Philip, again. Thank you, Thanks, Philip.